are coming into the room and chatting a little bit, I will just blab a little bit about what we're going to talk about tonight. Um, my name is Kara Slindert, if you haven't met me already, and I am a passionate plant lover, as well as the founder and director of Botanic Wise. And I'm really happy to be hosting this webinar tonight that is focusing on an important topic um, regarding medicinal plants and other plants um, that are maybe over harvested or endangered. And so um, we're going to have, Susan's going to um, talk to us tonight about creating sanctuary, sanctuaries for plants, the importance of protecting our plants. And we, we often think about protecting endangered animals, but maybe we haven't thought so much about endangered plants. So she's going to talk a little bit about that um, and exactly what native and at risk species are and the importance of them as well. Um, I'm sure we're going to get into invasives maybe a little bit too, and maybe mm -hmm. say something about essential oils. I'm just putting that in your head there, Susan. <laughs> I'd love to hear more about that. Um, and I, I love this, creating a medicine trail. Maybe you'll talk a little bit about that. I love that uh, concept. So I just want to encourage everybody to stay to the end. You don't have to stay to the end to win, but we're going to spin the wheel and we're going to... Um, award some lucky winner a ticket to the International Herbal Symposium, which is a benefit conference for United Plant Savers, of which Susan is the executive director, and Botanic Wise is a proud sponsor of. So, yay! So that will be fun. We like to have fun at these webinars and not just learn all the stuff. Um, so let me introduce our speaker for tonight. Her name is Susan Leopold, who has her, received her PhD in ethnobotany, so she's no dummy. She's extremely passionate about plants and is a, a defender of biodiversity. Um, over the past 20 years, she's worked extensively with indigenous peoples in Peru and Costa Rica. She loves to climb trees. As I mentioned, she's executive director of United Plant Savers and director of Sacred Seeds Project. And she's a proud member of the Potawatomi Indian tribe of Virginia. So that's just a little bit about who she is. There's a lot more, but you'll learn that as you get to know her better. So Susan, I'm passing it on to you. Great, thank you. Hi everybody, thank you for joining. Um, I love talking about the topic of creating a botanical sanctuary. It's really at the heart of um, United Plant Savers and our mission. For those of you who don't know, um, the, that United Plant Savers was founded, I think it, we're coming on 27 years now, and it was really founded at the International Herb Symposium. I think it was the second or third International Herb Symposium where, you know, Rosemary sort of posed the question to um, those that were participating at the International Herb Symposium, are you concerned about these native medicinal plants that are, be har that are harvested from wild populations um, and really uh, the backbone to the herbal products industry? Um, a lot of people said, yeah, they were concerned. At the time, uh, golden seal had come under a lot of pressure. People thought that golden seal was a good remedy for um, passing urine tests. You know, there's just some kind of strange rumors around there. And it had like spiked the interest in golden seal at the time. Um, uh, when UPS was founded in 1994, um, you could still buy lady slipper off the shelf in any health food store. Uh, the roots were dried and ground and put into capsules for people to take for sleep um, and things like that. So a lot of changes have come about um, with the awareness that United Plant Savers has, uh, has tried to create from a very grassroots perspective. And really the, the membership of United Plant Savers um, you know, came about because Rosemary talked about it at every single women's herbal conference that she went to. And so the bulk of our members, you know, are, are women um, who were learning about herbal medicine and learned about United Plant Savers. Uh, so it seems, you know, coming full circle that, um, that the International Herb Symposium would pass along to United Plant Savers as a permanent home going forward. 
Uh, the International Herb Symposium has always been a fundraiser for United Plant Savers. And now that we're really integrating the two, we're able to really um, ensure that plant conservation um, is at the heart of, of what we're teaching about with this um, opportunity to bring the International Herb Symposium online. I'm gonna try and share my screen. And I certainly want people to put questions um, in the chat during my presentation and I'll try and um, address those as best I can. Uh, let's see. Um, I'm just gonna hold on one sec. Um, let me try let me try that again. I lost my page. Hold on. I accidentally unplugged the server <laughs> when we were all prepped and ready to go. Okay, now I'm ready. Um, so that got discombobulated a little bit. Um, okay. I just wanted to take a moment to introduce everybody to the website. Um, if you go underneath programs and you click on the botanical sanctuary um, member directory, you can see, you know, uh, we have this interactive map. Actually, there's botanical sanctuaries around the world. Most of them are centered um, on the East Coast. And you can search the directory, see what botanical sanctuaries are near you. And under the BSN program, you can, um, you know, easily network to the uh, application to becoming a botanical sanctuary. Um, a little bit of history in regards to United Plant Savers, as I mentioned, it was founded in 1994 at the International Herb Symposium. Um, one of the things that UPS is most known for that came out of the original board of directors and group of individuals that helped found the organization was coming up with United Plant Savers at risk list of herbs to be aware of. And, and I, can, I can go into more detail about that in a second. Um, it wasn't long after UPS was founded that um, Paul Strauss approached Rosemary um, about a particular piece of property in Ohio. So United Plant Savers is based out of the United Plant Savers Botanical Sanctuary located in Rutland, Ohio. And at the sanctuary uh, we just built two years ago, we opened up um, the uh, Center for Medicinal Plant Conservation. There's a picture of the building and our greenhouse, um, which is full of plants right now. Anyways, the, uh, it wasn't long after um, the property in Ohio was dedicated as United Plant Savers Botanical Sanctuary that Rosemary, you know, had this idea to put it out there you know, let's really empower people to create their own botanical sanctuaries and let's grow this network of botanical sanctuaries. Um, you know, United Plant Savers is a very small organization. It's me, the director. We have um, Katie running the office at the sanctuary. We have Chip, who's our sanctuary steward and, and helps us take care of the land. And then we have two, um, we take on two AmeriCorps employees each year who help us nurture the land. So we are a very small organization and the idea of plant conservation is, you know, a big issue. So um, we can't do this work alone. We, we really need a network of plant people to be a part of uh, saving plants. We are a membership-based organization. We have an extensive membership of, you know, around 5,000 members that uh, support the work. May, they make what we do possible. And so the idea behind the Botanical Sanctuary um, is you can go online. I showed you how to find all the information under programs. Um, and 
through that, there's the application. And the application is really based on kind of three primary questions. And there's no right or wrong answer. There's no minimum amount of land or, or requirements or legal commitments. The questions are, you know, take inventory of your land. What native medicinal plants do you have on your property? You know, it doesn't have to be an extensive inventory, just, you know, um, a, a, a a basic understanding. You always want to take inventory of, of, of what you have before you move forward. Um, and then the other questions are, you know, asking you about your intention. Um, <clears throat> and that can be, that can be really anything. And I think just that process of writing down your vision and intention and, and, and trying to put into words your relationship you're trying to cultivate with the land. Um, and then the last part in, is really just thinking about ways that you can reach your community. How can you share about the work of uh, plant conservation? The application um, uh, requires a $100 fee and uh, people do ask to waive that fee, which we're happy to do if, if that's, you know, sometimes there's a community um, botanical sanctuary, so it might be difficult to navigate the funds or, you know, for whatever reason. Um, but really the money, the $100 goes towards um, three signs. We give you a big metal sign that uh, dedicates your land as a botanical sanctuary and two smaller signs um, that you can put up on your property to make people aware that you're part of the sanctuary. You can choose to be on the internet. You cannot choose to be on the internet. Um, we also have a wonderful uh, community grants program. If you're a, a botanical sanctuary, we provide grants up to $500 to help you get started with your trail system, to help you um, purchase native plants, to enhance um, the biodiversity of your botanical sanctuary, signage. These are things that um, we want to help botanical sanctuaries be able to do. One thing that's really great when you go down on the program list and, uh, under the Botanical Sanctuary Network, um, there uh, is stories. And in each journal, we, we send out a request to our Botanical Sanctuary members. If you want to tell us your story, we'll print it in our journal. And then we also put these stories up on our um, website. And really, I, I think the stories, I mean, they're so varied and they're um, so inspirational to read, you know, people have all kinds of visions for their land and things that they're doing, whether it's doing an, a, a class to nourish nurses, or if it's, you know, working with a, a, a local homeschool group, or if it's, you know, developing a trail because you're doing hip camp on your property and, and you want people to be able to walk your trails and identify your plants. These are, you know, just a just a wide range of um, different things that that people are writing about and dreaming up and bringing into fruition at their botanical sanctuary. Um, other things that we do, people reach out to us for advice. People reach out to us about um, where to source plants that they may want to add to their sanctuaries. Um, and you know, something that there's so much. Uh, information on our website under the resources tab there's um you know there's the call for, for journal entries um but there's just tons of great um uh let's see if i can get this to tons of great um hold on one second oh just trying to move okay here we go put this over here there's tons of great um resources like all the different um, publications we have. We have um, all kinds of um, really great PDFs. We have several publications you can purchase on our uh, website that are in print, but we also offer everything that we do in print online to be downloaded. So here's a great forest farmer's handbook. It gives in-depth detail of how to grow um, golden seal rams, black cohosh, and bloodroot. Um, we have our compendium, we have the tonnage surveys of, of all the wild harvested plants, we have nursery directory, we have reports, we have the take action guide, um, another, uh, another guide on botanical sanctuaries, so just tons of information to tap into. Um, uh, 
like I said, the conservation articles, we have a video gallery with uh, lots of um, uh, really great videos about the work we've done. Um, we did a full uh, several panels and in, in several different series, uh, Golden Seal <clears throat> Summit that we filmed in 2020. We have videos on the sanctuary, our intern program, um, our 25th celebration, the, uh, um, I don't know, just a hodgepodge of all kinds of, um, this is a great video on our ginseng and forest botanical symposium. I mean, certainly most of uh, the work we do with plants is based in the um, Appalachian region. Um, though we, we, we encourage sanctuaries to join from other countries through our Sacred Seeds program. That's under our programs. You can read about really interesting gardens around the world that are working on plant conservation of native medicinal plants. And, um, and yeah, so just tons of information. As I mentioned, the Community Grants Program, um, at the sanctuary, we have an, uh, an artist, uh, artist fellowship program, our medicinal plant conservation certificate program. And a big thing we're doing right now that we fundraised for last year is our hope for hydrastis. We're um, under a five-year propagation plan to propagate a tremendous amount of golden seal um, to provide forest farmers to take the pressure off of wild harvesting of golden seal. So there's just a ton of, of information to tap into. I do wanna highlight one other thing for our um, members in general. In the fall, we do um, roots that we uh, offer to our members. Um, it's often golden seal, but um, in the past we've, we've also done some other roots as well. And then in the spring, we, we try and um, offer different seed packets that um, that we think may, may be of interest to our, our membership as well. And then we sell some of these things on our, on our website year round. So, oh, oh, there's your hope for hydrastis. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's, that's awesome. Um, yeah, we, we did like a, as our fundraiser for hope for hydrastis, we, we offered, um, beautiful prints for, for those that, um, sponsored our golden seal propagation effort. So it's, um, it's really going well and, and it, it's a long-term process. Uh, we're looking at um, three years before we will begin to harvest the golden seal we planted and then we'll divide those roots. We'll provide some to forest farmers, we'll replant them. And then in five years, we'll even have, you know, a larger amount of roots that we'll be able to um, provide those uh, farmers that are registered in our forest grown um, verified program. So. That's, um, you know, kind of a, a, re a really big overview, but I think it's, um, I just want to encourage people uh, to not think that, oh, I need to do this, or I'm not quite there, I'm not quite ready. Um, I think, you know, any time is a good time to start um, creating a botanical sanctuary, wh whether it's on your property or, or whether it's um, a community garden that you're involved with. It's, it's just so incredibly important. I, I just got Doug Talamay's um, new book on the oaks, if um, you guys are looking for some great summer reading. But the emphasis that he makes uh, is he's an etymologist out of the out of University of Delaware and, you know, talking about how oaks support over like a thousand different species of caterpillars. I mean, it's unlike any other um, species that we have in, in our forests in North America. And without all those caterpillars, we wouldn't have food for birds to be able to feed their young. So it's like the, the, the integrity of native plants um, and, the, and the ecosystem services that they serve. I mean, we're really looking at, you know, um, a major uh, ecological collapse without native plants. And he's done surveys where he's looked at non-native species and what kind of insect populations they support and they support hardly any insect populations and without those insects we don't have the birds and it's like the whole the whole system collapses so i think 
Um, I like to think of that uh, as we get intrigued to learn about herbs, um, I, I believe it, it sparks something in us that makes us passionate and conscious about the role of native plants um, as uh, kind of fundamental to healing the land and then these herbs heal our bodies. So it's this relationship that we become like consciously tuned into where we understand how um, a healthy ecosystem creates a healthy environment for, for us. And I think that's the real message that these medicinal plants are trying to communicate to us. So that's, um, it's certainly, uh, anything that we can do to support native plant communities is so important and they are they are under such duress because we have you know it's not necessarily the fact that these plants are being harvested out of the wild that's put the pressure on them the pressures really come from the loss of habitat um, the type of uh, practices we have in place for logging, mountaintop removal, expansion of suburban sprawl, and a really, really big one is the imbalance of deer populations and lack of predators in the ecosystem. So, you know, it's, it's this um, combined effect, and then you add on the pressures um, that the herbal industry has placed on the demand for these plants, and that's that's where the whole thing kind of gets out of control. And that's that's the work that we're trying to do. And our, our at-risk list of these native medicinals, it's not very long, right? I mean, the majority of medicinal plants that we have access to, um, the yarrow, the elderberry, um, the dandelion, the mints, the thymes, the pines, you know, these are, are abundant, um, but it's, it's these other uh, plants that, um, we're harvesting that, uh, especially when we're using the roots and we're taking the plant completely, um, out of its <laughs> habitat. And then, you know, it takes decades to replace these populations. Um, so this is, this is the awareness that we're trying to share and, and also build a community of plant savers because we, we need thousands of them. And, so I'm hoping everybody on this call becomes a passionate plant saver in, in whatever capacity that that can be. Um, so I don't know. I haven't I can't see the questions coming in, but I could go in so many different directions. So I I'm happy to to answer people's questions. And I could I'm going to stop sharing my screen. <laughs> Okay, let me help you out. Okay. Um, Sharon, so Sharon, I just was clarifying, as a non-member, does she have access to all those cool things on the website? Yeah, everything, that's a big uh, aspect to this work that I feel really passionate about. I want this information as accessible as possible. So every nothing is password protected on our, on our uh, website for members. The, the, the benefit of becoming a member is just the, the capacity to support the work we're doing. Um, and if you can do that, great. And if you can't, that's okay too. Yeah. And a year's membership for an individual is really affordable, is it not? Yeah. $35. Yeah. So just so you know, it's not $35 a month or anything like that. Yeah. It's a pretty modest donation. Yeah. Um, yeah. Cheaper than Netflix. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Also, uh, a question about native plants. For somebody who's kind of new to identifying plants, how can they learn which plants on their property are native? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's, a, that's a, a good question. I mean, I really, um, I, you know, I would really try and tap into whatever resources you have in your community. Every state has um, the Department of Natural Heritage, and that's where you can find your state botanist. Um, obviously, you know, field books, guidebooks um, are are important. But yeah, it, it's it's over. It, it can't. I can certainly um, 
see how, you know, it can be overwhelming kind of determining that. Every state has their chapter for the Native Plant Society. I'm a member of the Virginia Native Plant Society. Um, and uh, so these are resources that are really good to tap into. Every, um, the NatureServe website is the national database on um, uh, native biodiversity. And uh, that's also a great resource to know about because one, for example, you know, narrow leafed ramps are endangered in New York and they're not in Ohio. So, you know, you can have, you know, uh, the, the conservation concerns of plants can vary from, from state to state. And so if you go on the NatureServe website, you can search a species and find out information um, of its status relative to the state. And like I mentioned, every, every state has a Department of Natural Heritage, and that's a great way to tap into um, who, who your state botanists are. Uh, certainly getting somebody knowledgeable to come and walk your land um, and uh, see what botanical sanctuaries are, are, are near you and join your Native Plant Society. These are all really great tools to, um, to figuring out which plants are native and non-native. Um, Rachel's wondering if you could speak about growing Solomon seal. Um, I absolutely can. We are actually propagating a ton of Solomon seal. Uh, Solomon seal is a, a pretty easy plant to propagate. You can, um, it propagates by its roots. Um, and also, uh, you know, there's, there's several, there's kind of a, there's two main um, uh, species of uh, Solomon seal native to North America. And one is like really tall, much, much larger. And then the other one is um, probably the one that most people are familiar with. And then maybe others have also seen the variegated that um, I, I've heard, you know, is, is uh, one you can use medicinally in, in the same capacity. Um, but it's, it doesn't like to be uh, too wet. It, it's easy for its roots to rot, but it's an edge habitat species. So it, it really likes, you know, a little sun, a little shade. It can, it can tolerate both those things. So um, gosh, it's, once you get it growing in your garden, it's, it can be really prolific and uh, such a great way to uh, make your own medicine. So I highly recommend people to grow it. It's really tolerant of a lot of different conditions and um, and we hope to be offering roots to our members in a few years once we get our our um, propagation uh, Ooh, up to speed. Sign me up. Yeah. <laughs> what about false Solomon seal? Um, false Solomon seal is also a, a great plant to grow. I mean, some of these plants can be difficult to locate. You know, you really want to look for your native plant nursery. Um, and uh, it's... Um, it's, it's similar to propagate. I don't know that it's, I, it's not totally my expertise. I don't know that it's used interchangeably um, medicinally, but um, it's, a, it's a beautiful plant to grow and, and I have it growing in my garden. Um, so there's a lot of specific questions about creating sanctuary. And yeah, one of yeah. them is how much land do you have to- There's no have? rhyme or reason. It, right. it, there's, yeah, I, we've had, we've had people, um, you know, sign up, uh, urban planter boxes, you know, um, awesome. yeah. <laughs> so, you know, it can start in your windowsill if it's got to, you know what I mean? It, 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 it happen, it can happen on the smallest scale to the biggest scale. So, um, you know, it, and things happen, people sell their land, you know, um, uh, it's, it's not, it's nothing that, you know, it's, uh, nothing that's stagnant, right? I mean, it's fluid. So we, we just support anybody who's got the passion and it can start, um, really small. And, uh, does it require that you only have native species in your sanctuary? No, no, that's, that's the thing, you know, it's just a starting point, right? It's, it's about setting that intention and, um, it, it, we ask that you kind of take inventory of, of what you have, 
Um, you know, but there's no right or wrong answer to uh, these botanical, the botanical sanctuary application. And, and sometimes the applications come with lots of questions and we're always happy to answer them. But it's really about, you know, um, that process of just setting out an intention, like what's calling you, you know, what, what is driving your passion? I mean, it, it could be, you know, um, wanting to learn about plants with your kids, or it could be, you know, interacting um, with your family or your community, or, you know, it, it's, I, I think you, we, we're all on this call because we heard some voice, right? Like something within us is like, I, I, I want to know more. I need to do more, you know? Um, I, I think it's interesting. You can, you can always, um, turn off my, you can, you can always, uh, I don't know, you know, um, it's just, I, I, I just encourage you to start anywhere, um, that you feel. Yeah. So, yeah, so Helen is, is saying, sh do you feel like we should, um, like, how do you feel about non-native species in your garden? It's kind of the same question, but asking a little deeper, should we ideally? I am not, yeah, I just, species? yeah, no, I just think it's the bigger picture, right? I mean, anything that we can do to encourage native plants is going to support a whole host of insects and, and things that we don't even might, all these different organisms depend on the interconnectedness that they've evolved with these native plants. I mean, I, I sometimes, I sometimes joke about my farm in Virginia that I farm invasives <laughs> because, you know, the tree of heaven, the autumn olive, the multiflora rose, the, the, yeah. the um, Japanese stilt grass, the, you know, it, we're not going to make these plants go away. You know, we're, we're, we're going to figure out how to, how to live with them, but the more we can do to create space for these native plants, the better, you know? And, um, so I, um, I don't know, I, garlic, um, garlic mustard. I used to do garlic. I mean, I still do. I, I used to make tons of garlic mustard pesto and sell it at the farmer's market. I mean, it's, <laughs> these invasives are talking to us. So I'm not, you know, I don't, I think it's like that you can't, it's just, we're, we're, we're just doing what we can in the moment, um, as best we can. And, um, I, I don't think we should be planting invasives. I don't think we can get rid of them. But I, I, I think we can try and bring more balance. You know, that's right. kind of- Well, cool. speaking of that, that's going to go to another question we have here, which is if you plant lemon balm and it goes kind of wild, which it does in my area, like I refuse <laughs> to put it in my garden again now that I've moved and started a new garden. Yeah. Do we call that native? Does it eventually become native because it's spread everywhere? But we really call that invasive, right? Yeah. Well, there's a, there's a term called naturalized and that's- that that's kind of what, what what can happen with something like you know lemon balm, mm -hmm. um, and and you could say that you know about um, plantain um, and 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 other species dandelion that, right yeah dandelion absolutely these are these are naturalized species that have kind of just um, you know found found their niche and and they don't uh, they don't tend to be as as devastating as as some of these other um, as some of these other invasives. I mean, I think that, you know, when it, when it comes to these native medicinal plants, they, they, they really only thrive in, in forming large populations when the ecosystem is really healthy. And so that means, you know, you, you don't see state, you know, stands of golden seal as, as far as the eye can see, um, in a forest that's been cut three or four times and it's, and it's, it's overtaken with, um, Japanese still grass. I mean, something like that takes the, the ecos, the, the niche away and then plants they're gone. So, you know, there's just something really important to tap into on, um, you know, what it means to have a healthy forest and, and, and why that forest is such habitat um, for these really special medicinal plants. And I think that's the message, right? They're, they're trying to teach us about the ecology. Um, yeah. 
So for an example, like to talk about kind of being flexible here, if you're an herbalist and you want to grow Tulsi, for example, like Tulsi, if, if it's an annual in your area, it's not native, true? True. And so you're growing holy basil because you want to have holy, maybe your yeah. intention is to make yourself this lovely tea in the yeah. summer. Yeah. Um, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, absolutely not. And I think, you know, there's, there's this continuum of, of human evolution with plant species, right? So we, we have this, and even, you know, obviously even amongst the, the Native American communities of North America, they were, they were very much forest farmers. They were in, they were uh, living and interacting within the forest ecology and the ecosystem. Um, and, and then you, you kind of see how a wild plant that was once wild and is, you know, being interacted with humans over, you know, thousands of years that then becomes this tomato plant that now exists because we collect the seeds and then we plant them to grow them each year. So um, there, there's a, there's a continuum of, of, of uh, human and plant interactions that are, are really important part of the story. And we're building on those interactions today. Um, and, uh, and, and certainly, um, we have such a plethora of herbs that we can grow in our herb garden that, that we can, um, enjoy for our, for our health and our herbal products, yeah. all those things. Um, but the awareness of, um, uh, these native plant populations that we, we don't quite understand how they propagate. Um, we can't just collect their seeds. We, some, it's very tricky to figure out what makes these seeds germinate. Um, we, re, we really need habitat uh, conservation um, to, to continue to have a home for these plants. Um, and I'm speaking about, you know, these woodland botanicals like the golden seal and the ginseng and the cohosh and the wild geranium and um, those those types of plants. Hmm. Carol is wondering if you could speak about mullen. Um, the wildness of mullen. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I'm, you know, it's, it's interesting. Um, I mean, obviously, mullen is something that appears in in um, old fields, and you know, you often see it like on the side of the road or in the medium, um, and. <laughs> I don't know. Most of the most of the mullen that comes into the herbal market, you know, comes from uh, Eastern Europe, where you know there's a lot of people picking the the mullen flowers. Um, but but certainly you can you know nurture a population, you know that that you can harvest the flowers and and certainly um, obviously the the leaves can be dried and 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 used in tea and all kinds of preparations. Um, I don't know if I know exactly uh, what the, what the question is is in regard to mullein. Yeah, she's wondering if it's like a native plant that we should be um, protecting, or is it kind of wild and? Yeah, it's it's wild. It's a yeah, it's abundant. I mean, it's not it's not one of our um, our uh, plants on on the at risk list. Yeah. Um, so KB says, can you give advice to someone who's wanting to start a botanical sanctuary on a piece of land that was grazed and abandoned and is now overgrown with invasives? Suggestions to encourage natives to return to the area. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, it, that's, that's tricky. I mean, I, I, I mean, there's, there's multiple approaches. I mean, um, I often say the do nothing approach is a good one. Um, and the aspect that, you know, uh, sometimes we do things that, you know, maybe, maybe make it more difficult for the land to heal itself in that regard. Um, you do nothing I, and don't spray. Yeah, exactly. Like sometimes the things we, we do to get rid of the invasives can be, um, you know, just as just as awful. I, I mean, and, and there are several approaches. I mean, one approach I took um, was I had air, areas that were just filled with 
um, autumn olive and multiflora rose. And, and I, you know, I, I had goats on the land for about five years and they really, um, they devoured, um, the autumn olive and the multiflora rose. So th there's, there's several, there's several approaches. Um, I do think, uh, again, um, there are, you know, resources out there, especially through NRCS. Um, there's regional NRCS people. Um, that's the, usually you find out through your ag extension agent. And there's, um, there are programs like creating pollinator gardens or uh, increasing um, riparian buffers. I don't know, have you gotten any um, NRCS or farm involved in any farm programs at, on your land? No, yes, maybe so. I mean, no, I mean, we have lots of invasives and my best suggestion is to, if you're starting a piece of land, don't, don't think you're gonna conquer a huge yeah. section yeah. Yeah, in that's one a good season, but start with a doable amount and maybe replace some of the soil too, or add to your, you know, compost and add to your soil. So there's, you can do a raised bed, for example, and you're still going to get invasive thistle, you know, for us, it's thistle, it's the tree of heaven, it's the autumn yeah. olive, like you mentioned, they all come up the multiflora rose, they'll come up no matter what, no matter what you even a barrier, because they're invasive, but you kind of learn to live with them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, totally. Totally. Don't uh, plan on having a perfect garden. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, we'll start, um, Wendy start. on that. Yeah, Wendy's wondering where we can learn about uh, supporting healthy forest. Yeah, um, that is a good one. I'm I, United Plant Savers has actually been working quite a bit, um, advocating through uh, collaboration with the uh, Forest Carbon Coalition and the Center for Sustainable Economy. Uh, we partnered with the John Muir, um, the uh, Dogwood Alliance, they're out of North Carolina. Um, there's just some really great uh, nonprofits focused on you know, advocating for sure at the federal level for uh, more forest protection, Appalachian Voices, um, so there's a, there's a lot of good nonprofits and, and, and we're all working really hard to um, put forth uh, a, a better vision for forests in the new administration and uh, really trying to promote um, healthy forests as a key component of um, the climate work that we, we need to be doing. Um, forests obviously uh, take, an, take in an enormous amount of carbon and, you know, a big theme, this will be a good tie in a big theme. In fact, the theme of the International Herb Symposium is, is going to be forests. And so our keynotes are going to be focused on um, medicinal forests for the biochemistry that they produce for the volatile oils that they put into our air. Um, mm -hmm like forest bathing, our understanding of how the mother trees work in our forest and how they communicate um, through uh, mycorrhizae, mycorrhizal fungi. Um, trees are, uh, are social beings and, and they're communicating and supporting each other, uh, sending resources to nurture sick trees so there's this whole awareness, I think, that um, we, ha we have to have to shift our mentality when we, when we see a forest and understand what it represents. Um, so we've got work to do. We've got work to do. Hmm, I can't wait. Actually, yeah. that sounds awesome. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to go deep. We're going to do a deep dive into forest ecology, and it's going to be a theme throughout the International Herb Symposium. So I'm, I'm really excited about that. The Herb Symposium is, is kind of split into several sections. One, we've got some just core herbalism and lots of medicinal mushrooms. And then we have kind of a whole section on what I call regenerative herbalism, you know, herbalism that teaches you how to grow plants and, and, and understand plant ecology, botany, all these things that make us better plant people. And then it's got um, continuation of the herbs for pets and animals. 
Um, mm -hmm. So a big veterinarian herbal track, which has always been a part of the International Herb Symposium. Um, so, so yeah, it's going to be. Um, a yeah, I, I can't wait. So Wendy adds that she has goats that she takes into her woods. She's worried about them overgrazing in the woods. Is that something she should be concerned about? She's yeah, I would be I would I would be reluctant. Goats are really, you know, they 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 forage on woody woody stuff. Um so that's why they're so great at tackling these woody invasives. Um I don't know. I, I would, I would be maybe limited in, in, in how I let my goats go into my woods. If you have woods that are supporting, um, uh, yeah, pop populations of, um, uh, of forest herbs. Um, right. Even young saplings would be yeah, like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's why deer is such an issue. Cause if you have a high population of deer, they love these spring ephemerals, right? The trilliums the ramps that, you know, they, they cherish these things. They're, they're mm -hmm. yummy. So um, yeah, controlling, being aware of your deer population and, and certainly, you, you know, you don't want ungulates tromping. I think, you know, um, if you want to, you know, have more diverse uh, layers to your forest. Yeah. Um, can you speak to the placement of Bursera microphylla on the list? I live in the northernmost fringe of its range in the US. That's from uh, Kawea, I may be saying the name wrong, from Phoenix. Right. Yeah, I mean, that that's a very, you know, unusual species that, that obviously has a very unique habitat where it lives. And I think less and less people um, are, are using that medicinally because of even the state and federal protections um, on, the, on, that, on that plant specifically. So, you know, certainly there, there are other plants um, on the list like the Venus flytrap and the lady slipper. Um, you know, these these plants are uh, already, you know, federally protected and 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 um, and state protected in in certain cases. So, um, yeah. So, Laureen asks, what would you recommend for city dwellers to grow in containers to promote native medicinals in their area? Great question. Yeah, I mean, I would think about those pollinator species, you know, um, I would, I would look at, you know, butterfly weed, and, you know, some of some of those um, more native prairie plants, echinacea, um, you know, these, these would be great plants that are durable and, and, and good to grow in, in a, and in that would, you know, survive in an, an urban environment like that. Are there cactuses that were at our, like at risk, like somebody for indoor only? Um, yeah, I don't know, but, you know, yeah. I mean, I think, um, I don't know if I have a good suggestion for indoor only, but. <laughs> Jocelyn might, Jocelyn's with us and she's an indoor plant guru in New York City. So I, 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 I yeah. You have a suggestion. Yeah, I love, um, I mean, you could probably grow kava and indoors. Oh, that's cool. <laughs> year. Um, but, but yeah, I, I think it's real. I really loved seeing the pandemic plant craze. And cause I think, you know, gr growing any plants, um, are, are fulfilling and, 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 and bring well being to your indoor space. So I, I think it's, it's been wild to see this craze in, in, in indoor plants. <laughs> I yeah, sourdough bread and plants. <laughs> yeah, it's like, do it Jocelyn, up. Jocelyn uh, put in the chat Dudleya, which actually I don't even know what Dudleya is as a recommendation for an indoor. Lots of Astrophytum species. Are those the ones that are? They're the ones, the little star ones that just kind of hang out on your windowsill with no <laughs> soil, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Those are cool. I love those. I like yeah. put them in my hair and walk around. Yeah. <laughs> um, so what else? Uh, when is the International Herbal Symposium? Yeah, so the International Herb Symposium um, 
it will kick off the weekend of uh, June 10th, um, which I, I just- It's all virtual. Yeah, it's all virtual. So we're gonna have some really interesting live classes that we're gonna be announcing. We're gonna be showing some movies. Um, so there's gonna be a lot of fun things happening that you can tap into or not tap into. Um, and then everything that happens on the weekend will be uploaded to the Teachable platform. Um, and then you'll have 18 months to have access to the platform. And there's going to be, you know, well over 100 classes. Um, and, uh, yep. And then, um, and then we're going to be releasing um, audio classes from past IHSs. Each month there'll be, you know, some new content that'll be dripped to keep mm -hmm. it interesting. And then we, we hope to um, really make it a learning journey that uh, we can create some opportunities for people to discuss and talk about things they're learning um, as they dive into the classes of the International Earth Symposium. And then it's going to, it's a big vision, right? But the, the vision is that we can take all the energy and love and creativity and herbal knowledge that's been brought together over the years at Wheaton College. And, and hopefully we, we plan to certainly go back in 2023 if we're able to, but I see this um, virtual platform as an opportunity to really start to create this global herbal village and, and um, connect people from around the world who are passionate about plants and, and kind of spread the awareness and also support each other. Cause I think that's a big thing, right? We can feel kind of alone and, and being passionate about plants and, and studying herbalism. And, um, and I think that that can be true with the botanical sanctuaries. I mean, I think just being a part of a network, um, I, I think it, it, it kind of helps us support each other um, to do this work because it, it can feel isolating and lonely and maybe confusing, um, but it, it's, it's really at the core of why we're here to do this work. That's how I feel. Um, Polly's wondering where she might acquire Solomon seal plants. Would um, Strictly Medicinal? Um, I, 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 yeah, I highly recommend Red Root Natives. Um, she's out of North Carolina. Um, and, uh, and, and if you come visit the sanctuary, you can leave with some Solomon seal. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, and, and one, thing, one thing that we just announced, um, we're going to have two weekends where those that are participating in the International Herb Symposium can come camp at the sanctuary. Um, wow. So we're going to be announcing those and, and that'll be a great time to come and, um, you know, get some plants and, uh, you know, connect with the land and, and, and see what we're up to. Wow, that's such a great idea. I love yeah. it. Yeah, so come camp out. We're going to do one in August. Oh, actually, we're going to do three. One in August, one in September, and one in October. So I'm pretty excited about it. That sounds so cool. So we can get together after all. Yeah, uh-huh. Um, Carol says, what herbs would you recommend for a very small area of planting to support native plants? She just planted goldenrod, calendula, and she's trying to fill every area of the space that she has. It's she's got a very sunny spot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think those are some good ones to start with. Um, what what did she say? Did she say echinacea? Is that? Was she that did, but I was thinking that too. Yeah, so echinacea would be a nice one to add into there, Carol. Mm -hmm. and, and you can get plants. Uh, if you've got an herbal friend, they've got echinacea plants, right? You can stop by my yard and I got a thousand. <laughs> yeah. And we have a, we have a seed packet that we're offering that has echinacea. We have echinacea seeds, um, but yeah, certainly traditional medicinals is a great seed source for um, all different species of echinacea. Okay. So switching back to the conference, I just wanted to clarify, um, do United Plant Savers members get a little discount? Is there incentive to become a member before registering for the conference? Um, yes, we, we are offering, um, a discount to members and I, you know, we have, we still have, we're going to be, the, the conference is $250. 
And then um, we're offering a hundred dollars off for members, but we are still, if you were to sign up today, we have not taken down the early, the early bird special. Um, but, uh, but cause we've had some problems. We were just making sure everybody who wanted to get it can get it. So it, it's probably in another day or two, it won't work anymore. <laughs> All right. So take action and save 50% off that ticket price. Yeah. yeah. So, this after this, while you're already on the computer. Yeah. And yeah. It's IH, it's what event. is it? I, IHS, the number four go. forest. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, IHS, the number four, and then forest, because it's IHS for forest. I'd already mentioned okay. that. We're, we're going to go deep. Um, Chris is saying, where in Maine? We're in Maine. I'm not sure what she's asking. The conference is uh, online. If, yeah. 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 The conference is online. Yeah. Oh. 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 They're talking to each other about yep. 10 acres in Maine. <laughs> <laughs> I missed something there. Yeah. I love Maine. Yeah. I do too. So, how about we spin the wheel okay. and? Choose a winner from uh, everybody who's registered, whether they're here or not live, um, they're eligible to win. And Abby has rigged up the wheel of fortune for us to spin and pick out a winner of a free ticket. This is great. To the International Herbal Symposium. Yay. Are you ready? Turn up your volume. <laughs> Those are the crickets. That's great. <laughs> I really love it. <laughs> Congratulations, Kimberly. We'll be in touch. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you, Susan. That was a lot of information and a lot more inspiration too. I'm excited to get in my garden before yeah. it gets dark under the light of the new moon. Yeah. Yeah. Really exciting. I definitely am going to apply for a botanical sanctuary. What the heck? I got a huge, huge. Ah, come on. Heck, I, don't know, I don't know what I have been thinking about, but. <laughs> <laughs> so all you good people, thank you for attending. It's been wonderful to yeah. be together again. I always love these live webinars. Always cheers me up at the end of a day. So thank you for being part of it. Thank you, Susan especially yeah. for your hard work, your passionate work, your vision, your stick to itiveness. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and your support of the plants. Yes. Yeah. Tenacious. <laughs> hmm. All right. Well, thank you Hello. for having me. Thank you for the support you've given over the years to United Plant Savers. And <laughs> Absolutely. It's going to go on and on and get better and better. Yeah. Great. Okay. Bye. Bye all. Ha, ha, ha.